Hey, guess what? The .NET Developer Days Conference is happening October 18th and 19th in Warsaw with some great speakers and over 30 technical sessions spread over two days. Among them are keynotes by Scott Hunter and James Montemagno. If you can't make it to Warsaw in person, they also offer a great online option. For only €150, you can access two days of live-streamed conference sessions, as well as all the session recordings after the show. Check them out at developerdays.pl and take 20% off your online registration with the code ROCKS. That's R-O-C-K-S exclamation point. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. It's been a while since we recorded, hasn't That's it? It's conference It's conference season, you know? That gets a little dicey sometimes. Yeah, you know what else it is? Barbecue season. Oh, funny you <laughs> should mention that. I have about 10 pounds of ribs sitting in the fridge to go into the smoker this afternoon. Nice, nice. Block party time, right? Kind of end of the summer. And yeah. So the neighbors all want to get together. I did a, uh, I had, okay, so here's the story. Mm. I'm renovating my garage, the back half of my garage, into Pwop Studios 3.0. Yay. Yeah. So I've been at, across the street from the original location at right. the Guard from Theater. Stage and, Street to Guard, and now you're going home. Yeah. Well, the reason that I can't really use that space anymore is because, hey, guess what? Pandemic's over, so to speak. And they got busy again. They got busy. Yeah. Yeah. You were helping them out back in the the day and now they're back in full swing. I'd also say this. Your garage is massive. I remember. It is massive. Massive. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm taking the back half of it. And the reason I said that is because your barbecue reminded me of it. I had some guys in the band over to help me get trash out, move things right, down to yeah. the basement, right? We did Many a whole hands day. Many make, make light work. Yep. And these guys were great. And I want to shout out to Dave Cafro and Tom DeFaria and Rich Gill. They came over and they helped. And I made, not mm-hmm. barbecue, but yeah. braised short rib tacos. Very Nice. It yeah, civilized. It was a huge pile of meat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all anybody actually wants, right? Yeah, it was great. That's awesome. All right, well, I let's get it. started with Better Know Framework. All right, buddy, what do you got? Well, it's a website that maybe you've heard of. It's uh, called .NET Rocks.com. Never heard of it. Not no. Thing. No. Yeah, well, the DonetRocks.com needed not only a, a UI facelift, but uh, a tech facelift as well. Mm-hmm. So I just went ahead and pulled the trigger, and it's a Blazor server application now. Right. And, uh, you know, it's in my milieu. It's something I know and love and understand. Sure. The As of this recording, the UI is still kind of Blazory and old techy and all that stuff. Oh, However... Yeah. I hired a CSS guru, Daniel Heikenberg, who is in your part of the woods, Mr. Campbell. He's worked with me on a project for a customer, and he's just great. So he came up with some designs, and uh, once we approve them, they're going in. I I mean, I will say the existing site, which, like you said, is very blazery. It's also responsive. Like, it does look – it is functional on a phone. And that's, you know, harder than you think. And the old one wasn't. Yeah. And plus, we don't have pop-ups now. Yeah. Well, the old one was, I mean, Joe Hewlin has a great aesthetic eye, and it's a beautiful site and so forth. Yeah. And it was a spa, right? It, yeah. It was very hip for the time. It was also remarkably SEO resistant. Yes. Like, it has hurt us in the rankings that Correct. use that engine. So. so, that's another reason why I wanted to use Blazor. And uh, there's, some, there's some ways that you can uh, optimize for search engines, do SEO mm-hmm. in a Blazor app. And I actually talked about that in Blazor Train. But here's the big challenge. There are two big challenges. Number one, um, pwop.com also moved to the cloud, and that was what hosted our old feed. Right. Right? So I had to do a redirect uh, on feed.aspx. We have a new podcast host. It's iHeartRadio, otherwise known as Spreaker. Right. And Spreaker has their own RSS feed, so that's basically where we're rerouting people to. However, that feed does not allow for tags, because guess what? The tags are in our database. Right. 
We invented them. We invented those tags. I mean, I, I also would appreciate you are finally re- retiring your hand-built RSS feed engine from like 2005. Obviously, yes. with updates, but you wrote that code a long time ago. That's right. It's ASPX, and it was running in an Azure VM, right? So, and it right. was written <laughs> feed.aspx was written in VB. Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a, and we, we've been talking about this for years that the yeah. downside to being a 20 year old podcast is scraping off the craft of 20 years, right? Yeah. That, that you, you rolled your own for everything back in the day because there was no other choice. Right. And there are better engines now. Plus, RSS2 is screwed up these days. Like, look at the feed. I know. It's, like, it's terrible. It's, Apple has all their own tags. And if you don't have them, everything's pro- broken in iTunes. Right? Like, That's it's, right. It's, it's nightmarish. I'd rather have somebody else take care of that. And the feed validators are unreasonable. Like, I took our regular Spreaker feed, uh, RSS feed, and I put it through the regular feed validator. It has all sorts of problems. Yeah. I think the feed validators are out of date. They are, yeah. Yeah. The real test is whether you can add your podcast by RSS to, you know, Apple uh, Apple Podcasts or whatever right. on your phone. And if it says it, it doesn't understand, then you got a problem, but it doesn't tell you much. Right. So anyway, this is the world that I've been living in for the last week. And I promise things will get better. Yeah. Um, another problem that we have is the old comments from uh, Discus. Yes, from Discus. I'm using... Yeah, I'm using a great comment engine and, uh, it basically, they have a way that they can import the exported comments from Discus. However, they don't like our uh, exported uh, XML file. And, um, I, you know, it, it's just the problem of being .NET Rocks. We were one of the first podcasts ever. So, for example, Spreaker feed only ha- gives you the last 1000 shows. Oh, sorry. <laughs> They didn't tell yeah. me that when I signed up. Yeah. Seems like enough for most people, and it's only half for us. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? So, there's problem number one. Problem number yeah. two, these comments didn't uh, import correctly. So, I actually had to read that XML file and parse out the comments and just have them statically as, um, as uh, uh, you know, archived comments. Yeah. And, it, of course, we're on Bullhorn today. We're streaming this. Yes. And so, of course, the first and the first and foremost comment about this whole experience is search. Yeah, because search is important. And right now, I think the search only works on titles, which is not enough. So, yeah. uh, search will improve. Yes, search will improve. Everything will improve. The look, the feel, the speed. It will all improve. Just bear with us in this time of crisis. <laughs> self-inflicted time of crisis self-inflicted but hopefully at the end everything will get better yeah anyway that's what i want to talk about today okay. who's talking to us richard you know we do not do enough accessibility shows and in the end this will be an accessibility show although i'm very excited to talk to courtney about yeah her her approaches and screen readers and that whole that's whole idea but one of the folks we lean on occasionally for accessibility is a lady by the name of Elle Waters. And back a few years ago, we were talking about accessibility in UX. This is from 1469, which is 2017, really too long ago. I'm sure there's more accessibility shows since then. I just didn't put accessibility in the title. Uh, <laughs> uh, and one of those comments on that show was from Chris Love, one of our favorite, yeah. uh, very conservative web developers. Yes. And I really appreciate Chris. Chris, I hope you hear this and know how much we adore you because you really push us to be the best kind of web developers we possibly can In be. other words, the least amount of data as possible to make the right experience. Oh, no. he Well, he's the guy who calls, you know, they're all fast food frameworks, right? Like yep. that mindset of write your own code, dang it. Yeah. Uh, but and he did make this point where he said this interview about accessibility is a must listen for every web developer. And the whole episode is a series of best practices with value bombs dropping everywhere. It's a good <laughs> line. Value bombs. <laughs> <laughs> and also to emphasize the point that if you do things right from the beginning, you will suffer less. Mm. And I appreciate he said less because not none right you're just gonna suffer yeah. less uh and you know you should do that but it's often quite tough to implement i think and i think the frustrating part of here is getting started on the right path takes longer and you really 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 want to write code so you tend to take shortcuts at the beginning and then actually get further away from your goal 
So mm. it's it does take time to get good at this stuff, but it's worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And it's great to evaluate some existing websites out there and start just seeing how they act mm. in the accessibility problems. And he brings up the point that, you know, go take a look at Amazon.com because it's a very accessible site when you put constraints around it. Yeah. And, it'll, and it can and help you learn. Uh, and Chris, you've got your collection of .NET Rocks. Millions. I'm sure you've already got a copy of Music to Code by, but I'd send you another if you really wanted one. Not that that makes any sense. Mm. It's digital assets. But thank you so much for your comment. And if you'd like a, a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there as well. And if you comment on the show and I read it, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet and and write it yourself. You don't need a framework. A <laughs> no tweet, tweet framework. No please. tweet deck. You don't need any of that. Just write us a tweet. I know. You know. I'm, not that I do this on tweets, but I you know how much I write between the book and the abstracts oh, yeah. and so forth. Grammarly is my friend. Grammarly is awesome. Grammarly catches stuff for me on a yeah. regular basis. There's no two ways about it. Although it has ingrained itself and embedded itself as a kind of a virus in my browser, and I don't know really how to get rid of it without mm. subscribing to it. I guess I will. Um, yeah, I pay I pay for Grammarly happily, just as yeah. – and, and I'll tell you the main reason, not the you – know, no sponsorship or anything, but it's the weekly email where it tells me how awesome I am. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Where how, how, it tells me how many words I've written that that week. Really? It tells me how many different words I used that week and how well, many corrections I'm, I needed to make. You've convinced me, Rabbit. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get a Grammarly uh, okay. because I need Sold. to be told how awesome I am once in a while. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We should go to work. You want to go to work? Yeah, let's go to work. All right. Courtney Heitman is an accessibility program manager for Gallup in Omaha, Nebraska. Over the last 10 plus years, Courtney has done everything from design and full stack development to user testing and project management. Her passion is creating a web that is usable and accessible to all. When she's not playing with new tech, you can find her working on new recipes in her kitchen or working on her farm. Wow. Mm -hmm. How, if you have a farm, how do you even have time? (laughs) To play with tech, create recipes or user testing and all that stuff. It's it's really all just, you know, project managementing of my life. You have to, you know, uh. you have Kanban boards for everything. Like, that's my <laughs> running joke. Like, if you give a project manager a project, you'll get a Kanban board. Yeah, so, like, job. I have, like, I don't know, 10 different Trello boards for, like, every aspect of my life. like Tell tell me there's a chicken Trello board. I love everything about that. Well, you know, it, I can there's imagine, not, like, yes. you know, how that would get old really quick. Like, milk cows, milk cows again, milk cows again, milk cows again. <laughs> yes, completed, completed. Wow. Yep. Wow, that's, that's it's quite a life you've got there. And uh, I'm a little bit jealous because, you know, everybody wants to, everybody dreams of having a farm, right? Correct. Self-sufficiency, eggs in the morning, fresh milk, fresh cream, you know, maybe some animals and stuff. But man, that's hard work. It's hard work. I I am lucky enough. So my, the room that I'm talking to you all from is actually my childhood bedroom. Uh, oh. I My parents moved across the road to my grandpa's house when he passed away a few years ago. And so I bought my house. And so I live in my childhood house. And so you're literally living in the house you grew up in, but now yep. you own it. I love that. That's awesome. Yep. That's it's a very fun. New England thing too, Carl. Like I, you're, yeah. your brother's in the house that you grew up in. Like, Yeah, that's true. Well, it's also just necessity, right? I mean, yeah, he didn't want to leave, but the house was available because my mother was living at her mom's house we right. passed on and that house he was living in it anyway so yeah it all makes sense yeah. i would point out that the best way to enjoy a farm is to have a family member who owns a farm because that's <laughs> how sure. i do it <laughs> i get it. to visit, sure. visit the family dairy farm on a regular basis and just admire it and then i get to go home it's like being a grandparent yes. You know, that's it. you hand yep. the kids back and then you, you just go give home. back. <laughs> we raised cows when I was in school, like high school, elementary and high school. And 
let me tell you, you even raising beef cattle that you don't have to milk every day you you still never get a vacation because the cows will know that you have left and they yeah, will yeah. escape <laughs> yes yeah they yeah will, and they will wreak havoc yep <laughs> All right, so I'm going to tackle the first line of of the title that Richard came up with here, vision impairment. And is vision impairment fixable by getting better glasses or It can be. <laughs> I mean, what do you do on your website for vision impairment besides braze the font? So, there's a several different ways that you can make websites accessible to people with different visual disabilities. There's a wide range of vision disabilities too you have everything from as all three of us are wearing glasses our yeah. kinds mm-hmm. of vision impairments to color blindness to people with very low vision to actual blindness yeah. and everything in between uh, you can also have people who have diabetic retinopathy and so they see different spots on the screen mm. just because of how their eyes work there's all sorts of vision simulators. Uh, mm. Chrome has several plugins that simulate different types of visual illnesses and like vision impairments. Hmm. Oh, I love that. And I really recommend people like download one and just kind of like look at them because you can see people that have like partial retina detachments and like mm, how they see the web. Just to be oh, able wow. to see what they see. Yeah. It's a good lesson in empathy and like, why is this a tool called chrome lens yeah i've seen that one there was one and i don't think it's in the chrome extension store anymore that was called no coffee that was really good i think it's still on firefox though okay um and i i've used that one quite a bit Hmm. um there's a program called color oracle that you download in your on your computer that simulates color blindness um and they have three different types Hmm on there although there's more than just the three but Mm -hmm. it changes your whole monitor so if you're not Mm -hmm. colorblind you can just change like the whole thing you can't like actually like do things but it'll change your whole screen so you can see exactly how it would look Um, and like that's really powerful when you're looking at different graphs graphs are a big one where you have a bunch of different colors yeah and that's where green and red show up right yep because they and don't occur naturally on websites. I, have, I don't see green and red on regular websites, but graphs. Wow. Yeah. Like you'll see some like brand colors might be a green or a red, but like very rarely are they used together unless it's in some form of data viz. Mm. And so actually showing those and like people actually being able to see what it looks like. Mm-hmm. It's powerful. Uh, I've spent the last three years working on creating new data viz colors for mm-hmm. my company because mm-hmm. we're obviously a data and analytics company. Most people know Gallup for Gallup polling. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do a lot of data viz and we've spent a ton of time researching colors and like looking at them and like tweaking them and do doing user testing with people who are colorblind or have mm-hmm. other vision impairments and just kind of going through the whole gamut of testing and trying to make everything as accessible as we can. Yeah. Cause I mean, for better or worse, these are the kind of tools where I love the empathy effect that I fire this up and suddenly I can empathize with, uh, with someone who's trying to use my software with it. But then the, the QA person in me, you know, that angry guy yep. uh, <laughs> wants to automate that. To yep. say, do we pass? And that's a much subtler thing. Like, how would you know mm. this site looks is easy to understand for someone with a, with a color blindness? AI, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. Any any? Th- I don't think there is an easy answer to that yet. Right. There is. So DQ, which is D E Q U E, uh, is an accessibility consultancy company, and they have um, Axe Core, which is their like main unit testing software that you can write it against it's open source uh they also have an axe extension if you are someone who doesn't want to write unit tests and you want to go through and use an actual like ui and test things and they do hmm. have a lot of things that you can check i think last i heard it was like close to 60 percent of accessibility that they can just like scan and make sure that like by using semantic HTML and like checking the 
hex codes against each other that that you're getting color contrast ratios right and all of that right, right. but i haven't seen one that deals with like true color blindness yet but yeah but i mean in one sense it's just like look at the palette and know mm-hmm. if you got a red green problem this palette's going to have a problem like and of course there's different color blindness just make it even harder so that Correct. i mean that's one attack to it but I appreciate that that some of this has just got to be functional testing and running it with the different filters on. Yeah, but it's, and yeah. but and I appreciate you went to color blindness just because you know Carl's initial thought was just scale the fonts up. So for someone with sight issues where size matters, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. We're both kind of Carl's the same age as I am, so we're both fifty five, <laughs> and boy oh boy. My fonts are getting bigger. Uh, do you, oh, man. I still remember that day that we were somewhere. I can't remember what country we were in, but you had to pull up an Azure VM on yeah. a really high retina, whatever it was, display, a really high yeah. resolution display on your laptop. And you were leaning forward and squinting and pulling your- <laughs> Lifting the glasses. Lifting your glasses. And, and I was like, so this is what we've come to, old man. This is where we are. Now. This is where yeah. we are. that's the cool thing about accessibility and inclusive design is a philosophy that everyone is going to be disabled whether that's situational temporary or permanently Mm, like we're all going to be disabled in our lifetimes we're all going to have vision and hearing problems as we age like it's just a fact of life and so helping people who have disabilities helps everyone yeah totally i totally agree uh, can we talk a little bit about screen readers? Just I've, I've yes. known uh, back in the green screen days, because I'm that old, I knew a developer who had who was was completely blind and used a Braille screen reader on a green screen to yep. code. Yep. And, and uh, Thomas, I haven't talked to you in a decade or more. That was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Like he was am- mm. and the speed that he read Braille at was staggering. And the best one-handed typist I'd ever seen, because he'd have one hand in the reader, feeling the bumps, and the other hand on the keyboard, and he's scanning and typing, and it's just, like, amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, And, like, I think a lot of people, like, the general population, even, like, the general tech population, don't realize how fast people either listen or read to, like, read a screen reader or a Braille reader, Mm -hmm. because they're so used to it. And so most screen reader users who are blind and use it like for permanently, like they listen at like two X, three X, four X speed. Like you would a podcast. So it's just going really fast. Yeah. And like, they know exactly the keywords to listen to. I use a screen reader on a weekly basis, testing things, if not daily, and I still can't listen as fast as most of them do. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, like, you're uh, kind of an impaired screen reader user. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what do modern screen readers even look like? Like, what are they doing? Because we don't have 80 by 25 on our screens anymore. Correct. So there's three main modern screen readers that people use uh web aim does a survey about every year and a half to two years and they survey everyone who uses screen readers Mm -hmm. um and they kind of figure out who like what the top screen readers are because screen readers are still very much in the like browser wars era of the internet oh man i mean that's good and bad right like it means that it's technology is evolving but there's no yep. definitive answers to anything. Yep. And the screen readers, JAWS, NVDA, and VoiceOver are the big three. Um, and then talk back on Android. So like your big three on computers, like they all operate differently. Like none of the keyboard strokes are the same for hmm. the most part. Like oh, some no, of them yeah. are, but a lot of them operate like to read the next paragraph on voiceover it's the voiceover keys and then a Mm. and on jaws it's just the down arrow on the keyboard so they're like completely different and so if you're bouncing between them as a developer it can be really hard to like figure that out and and these are all voiced screen readers are they Yep, all voiced screen readers okay yep And and do they leverage focus to make them work like how do they know what to read So they use semantic HTML, like what HTML we put on the page and ARIA roles to know 
what to read. So they can tell you can navigate the web on a screen reader via links. You can navigate via headings. You can navigate and just like actually read the page. Oh, a lot of screen reader users go through and navigate and they'll either read just the links on a page first, kind of like us with vision would go through and just kind of like scan the page to see what's on the page. They might choose to go through all the headings, like all the H tags that are on a page to kind of scan it to see what's even on that page. Right. Mm. And they might do the same thing with links before they even go through and read like the paragraph text that's on a page. And so then now we get into this whole semantic side of building your pages so that screen readers have a chance. And you just said there's an arms race, which means different readers approach this different ways. <laughs> I yep. was just complaining about messed up RSS. It sounds like we got the same problem. Kind of. They, it's still very much, it, it's like back when IE8 was a thing and like you uh-huh. couldn't use certain CSS and JavaScript things because IE8 was like, no. No, we know CSS kind of like better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the real sin was IE6. I mean, IE6 yeah. shipped before CSS1 was ratified. It was right. literally its own version of CSS. Nothing else. Yes. <laughs> that, and then it was popular because it was the default browser for XP. So. Yep. Because what was your alternative? Windows 2000? Because you weren't going to use Vista. No. Uh, (laughs) Did anyone use Vista? (laughs) I guess willingly use Vista. (laughs) No. Oh, man, that's so long ago. And just painful memories. Painful. You know, it's really great during the Vista era. Start an IT podcast. (laughs) Ask me how I know. (laughs) Well, you're not at a loss for content, that's for sure. No, no. Uh, uh, how, how do, do I, I get go around back this? and look at those early shows? We did not talk about Vista very much back then because <laughs> yeah. nobody wanted to. We were all sad. Right. Uh, well, you talked okay. about why not to use Vista anyway. Now, yeah. what about all the built-in stuff in Windows? Like, Do you need these things when there's so much accessibility features in Windows? Microsoft does so much work to put accessibility in windows they have their own version of a screen reader called narrator uh and it's kind of picking up use um jaws is still the top uh screen reader and jaws uh if anyone has ever purchased a license of jaws uh is expensive it's like over a thousand dollars a year holy man wow a year a year so it's i mean you were talking about screen reader as a service Pretty much. (laughs) Okay. And then as opposed to, hey, Windows Narrator is built in. Yeah. Narrator is built in. NVDA is free and open source. Like people can go and like update NVDA software on GitHub. Mm -hmm. I never have. I know people that have filed bugs and stuff on GitHub when they find things. Um, And people will go update things. NVDA is for... The last uh, WebAIM survey, which was about two and a half years ago now, maybe closer to three, um, they were neck and neck. Like it was literally like when Chrome and Firefox were like at both at 50% use or like 45% right. use, and it, everyone was like, what's going to happen? And Joss has kind of edged back up in the last survey that WebAIM did, but it's NVDA still gets quite a bit of use and it's open source. And and this is the NVA NV Access Organization, which is a charity. Yes. Okay. Yep. You, like you think they'd be the winners, just because these are folks who are literally their mission through and through is to help the visually impaired be empowered. Yep. For better or worse, I guess Jaws had a better marketing budget. Presumably, they had a good product too. I don't. I don't know. But. Yes, that's. I think that's the main reason why Jaws has stayed around as long as it has, is it does have a good product. Like they were the market leader for years upon years upon years. Years and years. Yeah. And they have continued to improve it using the money they're collecting. They're they're doing something with it. Uh, Hey, um, Martin Vandering in the chat for our bullhorn stream was asked the question, uh, does it matter if the screen reader voices are more natural? Hmm. Because I know the windows narrator voice, not that natural. Like you very much know it's a synthetic voice. So I work on a Mac primarily, so I use voiceover. And I know on JAWS, you can actually change the voice of the screen reader. So you Mm -hmm. can have it have different accents. We have an internal auditor at my company that I work with quite frequently. And he 
has his set to an Irish accent at the moment. Hmm. Oh, great. Just to like switch it up and like have something fun. And occasionally he'll go through and change it and it'll all of a sudden be like an American accent or a British accent or an Australian accent or whatever. And so you can make them sound more natural. Most people who use screen readers to like you, you like look at different things on the internet theirs are so sped up that you don't even really notice. Right, I was going to say it might just get yeah. in the way, you know, because yeah. the most important well, thing is understanding what the heck they're saying and being fast. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, yep. I mean, it's certain, there, in theory, there's certain accents that are clearer. Yep. I, I always defer to the Canadian accent. It's clearly the superior one, uh, <laughs> but, and the most modest. Yes. Yeah, so that's it. That too. But speed is of the essence. So it's what what are the sounds that you can pick up clearly when you're running at this crazy rate that they want to that they want to run at to be efficient. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And like a lot of people, if you've never listened to a screen reader or like messed around with one um, and actually like heard a vocal one, I always have people turn on the one on your phone. Both Android and iOS have one built in. Right. You can just turn it on and most of the gestures are just tapping on the screen with like a different finger combination. So it's not super hard for most people to pick up and like actually listen to what a web page sounds like. Right. Mm. Whereas if you're using it on a computer and you've like never used a screen reader before, you normally have to download software unless you're on a Mac because voiceover is built in on Macs. Right. And then you have to go set it up and then you have to learn special keyboard configurations of like how you're going to do things. And like, that's a really steep learning curve for yeah. most people. <laughs> sure. Especially, and then throw in and your vision impaired. So all these yep. requests you're making are challenging <laughs> to figure out in the first place. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and folks, I need to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. Do you spend too much effort on handling content in your project? Stop solving boring tasks and get back to the code. Content.ai is the modular content platform that enables marketers and developers to plan, create, and deliver experiences that look and feel great on any channel, not just websites. But if a website is your main channel, you can leverage the CDN-backed content delivery with .NET Core SDKs, .NET Model Generator, and Fluent API, which makes it easy to filter and order content. What makes Content.ai truly unique is the ease of doing business with. With hubs in New York, London, Amsterdam, Brno, and Sydney, Content AI's globally distributed team ensures the success of leading companies like Zurich Insurance, Algolia, and Oxford University. See more at Content.ai slash developers. That's K-O-N-T-E-N-T dot A-I slash developers. Or visit them at Live 360 Conference in Orlando or Dev Intersection in Las Vegas. And we're back. It's Dot Hat Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey, hey. And we're talking to Courtney Heitman about vision impairment, screen readers, uh, and accessibility as a whole. But of course, obviously focused on the vision side of things because you know, there are other impairments. Mm. Yep. Uh, I've certainly, you know, there's a whole world of custom controllers and. Uh, for various mobility uh, challenges for uh, hearing impairment as well. Hmm. But I'm happy to stay on the vision side just because it's complicated. It's not one thing. Correct. That's very I, true. I, I I have dug around a little on YouTube and watching someone who is an expert with a screen reader just to see what it looks, because it's so detached from what you're used to, the speed that they're listening, the way they approach things, how quickly they stop something, like – all yep. of the stuff you would normally do when you're scanning a, send, a a paragraph and then move on without finishing reading it because you don't need to. You've got what you want and you moved on. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I noticed was, is that you know, no sentences are being finished. They get the gist, yep. they move on. Yep. And you, we call it a hush key, um, my different teams at work. Mm -hmm. uh, every screen reader has a hush key where you can just press it and it'll like stop reading whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also one of the first keys that when you start using a screen reader to like test your website that you should learn because all of a sudden your screen reader is just going to start going and like reading and you're going to be trying to figure out how to use it. And yeah. so you're listening to it and trying to think and like 
It's kind of complicated and overwhelming. <laughs> so look up what the hush key is. Okay, yeah, you'll want that one like, right away. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to stop. You're freaking me out. <laughs> but I also think because you're not vision impaired, you keep trying to use your eyes. Yep. I like, what frequently have people shut off their monitor when they're using a screen reader. So that way they can get like the full experience. Like your computer's still on either if you're on a laptop, put a piece of paper over your screen or Mm. shut your monitor off if you're on an external monitor. So that way you can actually see if you're getting the info that like you need to be getting, or if like you're getting placed in a weird spot on the page and it doesn't make sense. Mm. Or like maybe, maybe you need to move instructions. Like maybe your password requirement isn't above where the password field is. So you don't right. know that you have to input a special character and an uppercase character and all of that. And so like maybe you need to put it above there. Mm hmm. So that way someone can read it and know when they're using a screen reader exactly where it needs to go. Oh, so well, I always advocate. This is also the, a path where typically as developers, we make mistakes because you're never logging in for the first time. Correct. And so to create that barrier of entry for someone is like they can't log in because you did not tag up the, uh, the information for the passwords well enough yep. to just get past that hurdle. Mm. Yeah. So um, I can imagine it might take some getting used to to shut off your monitor and use a screen reader, uh, especially at a fast speed, you know. Yes. So so do you do you have any guidelines for like start out at a regular speed and then slowly increase it until you can understand it? I mean, I can imagine that could be take a long time. I almost never actually make my screen reader read faster than 1x speed just Mm. because I don't use mine enough to actually get used to the high speed um, talking. And most of the time, I'm just like spot checking pages. I'm not using it as a like to surf the internet, basically. Right. Yeah. And so I keep mine kind of at a one X because I want to make sure that it's reading all the things that it's doing. I want to make sure if I'm on an accordion menu that it's saying that it's expanded when it is expanded or it's collapsed when it's collapsed. Yeah. Um, So that way I actually know all of that. And if it's reading too fast, I personally cannot pick up on it. It's anxiety inducing. Mm. It is. And I always, when we all of our developers uh, at my company go through accessibility training uh, in their first quarter when they start. And I always tell them, I'm like, if you have never done anything with accessibility, like do not start with a screen reader. Like you are going to be in over your head. Like <laughs> we want you to start small and like work your way up. Like Build let's up. start with some automated testing. Let's start with yeah. like keyboard testing right. and then work your way up because using a screen reader is it, it's different for most of us because it's not something we use. And so you have to think about the web differently and you have to like just completely flip your mindset of how you do things on the internet. Mm. And like, that's a big learning curve for a lot of people. Sure. I like the idea of starting with something like colorblindness Mm -hmm. Uh, just because it's fascinating. It's instant. Just looking at the test, it's like instantly empathy generating. It's like that button vanished. Mm. Yep. Right, gone. It was just the wrong color, and now that they'll never find it. Yep, uh, that's interesting, and it uh, maybe a little less intimidating. It seems like screen le- reader is like the level ten of ten. Yes, like yep. you work your way up. Some of the semantic stuff, some of the macular challenges, like being able to zoom and so forth, like all of those different pieces, and then uh, you know, like okay, you've graduated now. Let's go <laughs> do the scary thing. Yep. And that's mostly what I tell people like it even running automated tests, like they're looking to make sure that your HTML is semantic and that you're using all the correct things that you're doing. So in theory, they're catching a lot of the issues that a screen reader user is going to find anyway. And so like you're helping and we're like, we need to start you easy. So you don't like, all of a sudden ha- use a screen reader and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And like, this is confusing and I don't like this because we want to make the web better for everyone. So we're like, okay, if we start small and like add a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, and you just keep working your way up on the difficulty level, 
Mm -hmm. You can make some really accessible websites and learn a lot along the way. Uh, I'm going to synthesize a few other comments here from the from the bullhorn stream from our live viewers here. Dave Ackroyd talking about how uh, whether or not newer computers are better set up for accessibility, which I think mm. is generally true. But he also talks yep. about he also mentioned multi monitor machines. Yeah, because I think for as developers, we're often dealing with multiple monitors, which is kind of handy for us in doing development. But how do screen readers cope with that? Mm. They read whatever your active window is. Right. So, so you have to have uh, enough vision to click the mouse on a particular window or alt tab or tab through and know that it's selected. They use it. Most screen reader users use a keyboard, but they like, no, like you have to know how to navigate through your browser. And my least favorite thing when I'm like spot checking a page the Outlook and Teams notifications will read when they come through because as sighted users, like we read them as they come through when we're looking at pages and they pop up in our upper right yeah, corner, right? Right. But on the other hand, if you have windows stacked on top of each other, like what do you care? You're not looking at them anyway. Yes. You're listening to them. You just tab through them. So why would you bother with multiple screens? Unless there are different zoom levels because you've got you're partially sighted and so having a heavily zoomed screen helps. Yep. And there are people who do that. Um, mm -hmm. And there are screen reader users that aren't, maybe don't have vision disabilities. Maybe they have ADHD or dyslexia mm -hmm. and they use a screen reader for that. Um, yeah, because they comprehend better spoken than they do trying to read. <laughs> yeah, your, your dyslexics and things like that where the written word is very challenging. Yeah. I, I also, I've seen this also the sync version of that where they're highlighting words and saying them because if you poke both sides of the brain, it's easier to comprehend. Mm. Yes. I, I've seen that quite a bit, especially mm -hmm. on transcripts. Um, you'll see a lot of transcripting software that highlights yeah, and like highlight, reads yeah. in sync while you're listening to the podcast or the video or whatever. Mm. It is fascinating what it does to the brain to have both the written words, spoken words synced. Because it literally it is. is different parts of the brain. It seems to help with retention. And you, you would think that it'd be cognitive dissonance, but it's not because they're both the same symbols in the brain, aren't yeah. they? Whereas yep. if you have a picture of a duck and then some text that says, hey, you know, this is an interesting picture of a duck, but it's not really a duck. Maybe it's a, you know, whatever. Yeah, very hard to read and observe something different yeah. at the same time. It is important to do that stuff well. To, to, to sync those things together. But it, and it is it, like now we're talking about different classes of, of uh, disabilities mm -hmm. where it's like, how do I help someone comprehend all of this stuff? That's the big one. Uh, and one of the things that WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, have like openly admitted that WCAG 2.0 didn't do a great job of helping people with cognitive disabilities. Like there aren't really rules around that. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of the different laws around the world are based on WCAG. Like WCAG is the standard that most people strive to, to be legally compliant in different countries around the world. And like they're getting better. And like the focus for WCAG 3.0, which is still years away uh, from being implemented is mm -hmm. to help put different cognitive disabilities um, mm. more in the forefront as we're working on all of the other things. And cognitive disabilities are really hard to develop around because they are so personal compared yeah, like from yeah. person to person. I mean, I'm excited that they're taking that on, but it also makes us realize like they're just taking that on. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like they, the current draft for WCAG is 2.2 and they, they seem to have a pretty tight a timeline around where they're going to get with that. Mm. But three seems like a big leap. It's going to be a big leap. They yeah. have, a couple different success criterion that they've released as drafts um, and like asked for public comment on, but I, it's going to take years. Like I'm well, going to say like five to 10, just like personal opinion. That's, that's something, but also it's like the, the folks that need it most are ones that are going to have, are have a tough time contributing to it too. Like yep. they, it's going to, this is going to be advocacy driven, which has its own set of problems. It's very true. It does. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. And it, 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 I appreciate that we're there, that we're now talking about the, these physical impairments. We're getting, we're getting a handle on how to deal with that. And the web has improved enough and the process of maturing the web has improved enough that we can do that. Yeah. So now we're going to talk a, a way harder problem. 
that yep. need, you know certainly needs to be done, but uh, is not going to be an easy thing to pull off. I've grabbed a lot of links so far, so as requested by the chat room. But every time you mention something, uh, Courtney, <laughs> I go find it and add it to it. Because these are all things I want to play with now. This is really cool. I don't know if I'm going to pay for JAWS, though. That's a lot of money for a screen reader. Holy man. Start out with NVDA. That's what yeah. I recommend people who use Windows computers. Start out with NVDA. Um, if you have never used a screen reader before and you want a i will actually pull mine off the wall because i still use mine mm. uh dq has these nice little one pagers this one's for voiceover that tells you exactly what commands you need to do to do what right you can find them on dq university um and they're free you can print them off obviously mm. i have mine printed and hung up on the wall on my, you wall can next read it. To my desk because yeah. i use it like yeah. occasionally i'll be like i don't remember what the command is for this thing what is that <laughs> But you're also right. working across more than one. And I've included yep. a link. They're the folks who make the Axe testing tools. Yep. So they, they had, all those docs are there as well. Yeah. DQ has great learning resources. Um, all three of the big accessibility consultancy companies, so DQ, TPGI, and Level Access, do different webinars on accessibility. Um, so you can sign up on their websites and go through them. Uh, WebAIM is also a big uh company that does a bunch of uh different webinars uh they actually just had a conference this past week oh wow um with a bunch of different things and then if you're like into audio accessibility three play media also does a ton of webinars huh. about transcriptioning and captioning and audio descriptions audio descriptions are a fun one that most people haven't really heard about uh, mm. which i'm happy to talk about it's how yeah uh, people with low to no vision watch things on Netflix or movies. They, uh, three play actually has a really good video, uh, where they describe it's a scene from frozen. Uh, Sven, the reindeer is playing with Olaf, the elephant, and they describe exactly what is happening on screen and you can hear it along with the dialogue. So it's what someone with low to no vision would hear like as they're enjoying popular culture media, wow. right? Cool. Is that like two simultaneous audio inputs, a description yep. of the scene and then the sounds of the scene. They have mm. a player that three play makes that it pauses the actual like movie while it's talking through the like background of like Sven is doing like this and jumping around and like whatever mm. is happening on the screen. And then it'll, restart playing the actual video so you'll hear the dialogue between them and then it'll pause to describe more and then i'll start playing the video it's really cool hmm. and captioning did automated captioning has gotten dramatically better i mean dramatically it, better yeah. it is still not great you will still hear people with audio disabilities call it craptions <laughs> um, right and but it has gotten significantly better um it's gotten to the point where even like if you're scrolling on TikTok and people are using their automated captions, they're close to like 95% accurate now. Right. And like, it's super helpful. And I always tell people like, if you want to help people with disabilities and you see uh, a, a different company like TikTok who starts using automated captioning, TikTok keeps trying to like turn theirs off and be like, well, but like people aren't using it. I have mine turned on. Like I don't, I'm not someone who normally reads captions like mm -hmm. and needs to read captions, but I keep it on. So it helps with usage statistics to show companies like, like, yeah, people, people do want this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah, know. Very, yeah, very powerful. The audio description stuff's got to be more challenging to create like that. Definitely. That's, that's got to be an art form to succinctly describe a scene. It is. And there are several. I know Netflix has audio description shows that you can find. I think HBO has some, too. Mm -hmm. And like they're getting better and there's they're becoming more and more shows that have audio descriptions. If anyone wants to check them out. You can definitely, I'm pretty sure you can like Google audio description shows and you'll probably get a list of several of them. Um, of last time we talked about, maybe not the last time, but certainly before when we talked about accessibility and screen readers in particular, there were some special 
uh, markup tags that you could put in your HTML that makes screen readers, uh, that makes it easy for them. Uh, are th- is yes. that still a thing or are screen readers just hip enough to parse the content? So ARIA rules, uh, there, ARIA is actually an acronym. It stands for accessible, rich internet application, I mm-hmm. believe. Um, you'll see a lot of them and that's the easiest way. Let's say you're try you're developing something in react and like, you need to make a span tag, a button. Yeah. Um, because that happens, <laughs> um, especially in JavaScript <laughs> frameworks. Right. Uh, it, they tend to be the, the ones that cause that to happen. You can mark it up using ARIA to make sure that it's doing exactly what it needs to be doing and what it's reading to screen readers. Cool. I personally use a website called ally support, a 11 Y support IO. Um, it's, I would consider it the can I use of screen readers. Hmm. Um, so it allows you to see what screen readers have implemented, what in different ARIA roles, um, and it is an open source application. I actually know the guy who built the website originally. Uh, he and I co-run the Nebraska Digital Accessibility Meetup. Wow. I use it, like, honestly, probably daily to double check things for different developers. Hmm. When things are just, like, acting weird and you're like, is this, like, actually acting weird? Like, is it a code problem <laughs> or is it a screen reader problem? And it's a really good gut check. Mm. So... Very cool. Yeah, no, fa- and fascinating just to to go through that and to just pr- provide. This is not complicated. This is just a few extra tags here and there, right? Saying, yep. "Hey, your ro- this role, this div is role is navigation, and and you know that kind of thing. This is content info, and and yep. just to help point the way. And do those tags behave consistently between the different readers. They do for the most part. There are some that have not been implemented correctly or completely across all the different screen readers right Um, it just depends but for the most part they act the same for the most part awesome well courtney uh i got a huge list of links here this is lots to think about ginormous and uh, and yeah (laughs) back back to the challenge of it's worth putting some you know i'm going to go back to chris love's comment work on this up front play with some things, then go dig into a new site mm. and see if you can't do it better. Great stuff. It It's so much easier to do accessibility from the beginning. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a running joke in the accessibility advocacy space of, do you want to build a website once or twice? Because if you're trying to make it accessible, if you do it from the beginning, you're probably only going to build it once. <laughs> Somebody should have told me that in 2002. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I built that website five times now for different reasons. At least five times, but it's also been twenty years. Yeah, that's though. true. Hey, one last question, Courtney, before we wrap up. Uh, Martin in the in the chat was asking, uh, "What do you think of e ink screens? Are they more accessible, less accessible than hmm. your typical LCD?" I think a lot. Of, I think some no like low vision people use and prefer e ink screens. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think e ink screens like as someone with mostly full sight minus my, you know, farsightedness. Um, I think that they're more accessible when you're like outside in the sun yeah. because you don't have that screen glare. We're talking about Kindle and remarkable and those things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so like, they're really nice for that. And if you were someone who maybe suffered from migraines and was in an office that was highly lit, I could see an e-ink screen being really great for that because you wouldn't have that screen glare that's like furthering your migraine mm. and like all of that. Yeah. I also say like, like get the newer monitors with yep. the LED backlights, not the fluorescent backlights. Like the yep. fact, when, once you have spectrally adjustable backlight, life is better. Well, you can use flux or you can use night light to adjust that as well. The the blue light is the worst, but only if you have a new, uh, you know, only if you have a new monitor, right? So I often are talking to folks who struggle with this stuff. It's like, well, how old's your monitor? Because you change your computer, but you keep using the screen because it still works. And it's like, dude, yep. go buy a new monitor. You'll never go back. I used like, flux so on those, uh, you know, for years and years on those big Dell monitors that I had at the studio. Yeah. So you're saying if your monitor is like 15 years old, it won't yeah. work. Well, and, it, and I find folks like that. Right. Right? Remember that old, I had that old uh, DVI-D 
yeah. uh, high res screen, mm. 2560 by 1600. I still have and, them. But yeah, they, you know, they, they have limits. Yeah. So, but then you go sit in front of a new monitor and you're like, oh, oh. Okay. It's amazing how much <laughs> monitor technology has changed yes. in even the last like five years. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it's like you need you use it every day for crying out loud. Like, yes. you'll get a new tech. Well, Courtney Heitman, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you this uh, show, and it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Come back and talk to us anytime, will you? Will do. All right, and we'll see you next time on Dot Net Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got